Yeah, but I, I'm not calling you father, I'm calling you son. <laughs> as old as your grandfather. Yeah. You see? I mean, this is human language. Call a young man, my son, my son, my child. In the, in the Sulus, you call that, nobody says it. Nobody. Every, nobody minds it. But if the person who doesn't know that relationship, if I call him my son, beta, in Urdu is a beta, means my son, no Pakistani or Hindustani will ever mind me calling him beta. Or your daughter is a betty, my daughter. You mind it? No. But if somebody who doesn't know the relationship is asking me, is he really your son? I says, no, you see, I love this young man. He loves me as a father, like a grandfather, so I call him a son. That's what I meant. But instead, if I said, yes, he is my begotten son, the meaning changes. That's why this young man was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> the meaning changes. He says, yes, mera jana hua beta. When I say he is my begotten son, mera jana hua beta, which means I have something to do with his mother. When I didn't even know, doesn't know what she looked like. Can you see? So, when you say begotten, don't come out with the excuse that it's not modern English, it is in the Oxford Dictionary. If you haven't got one, I'll get one for you, maybe from the library. And I'll show you, it is there today. Begotten means to beget. Begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. And we are not to attribute such a quality to God, in short. No man, how we philosophize and sophisticate and say men this and men that, the language itself is down to earth. We are both trying to say the same thing, that Jesus was born miraculously. We are going together. The language, we take exception to it. The language you are using, using is down to earth language. For God and our relationship with Him, we must use the sublime language befitting Him and His relationship. You don't talk like you're talking to your, any Tom, Dick and Harry, your friend. See? So the exception that the Muslim takes is to the language that is being used. Uh, any other questions in the meantime? Yes, just uh, uh, your name. Can, could you kindly identify yourself? Yeah. Sayyid Ahmed Shah. Right. Yeah. I'd like to come back to the uh, subject of uh, God and the one thing that's been bothering me constantly. Among other qualities of Allah, one is Allah Rahimi. Is ever, so, <coughs> is ever so benevolent, is ever so forgiving, is something that one feels like love. Now, if I were to consider love, then I'm not confused about fear of God, which is the of of fear of God. Now, fear does not be <coughs> inside of God. And all these attributes are loving. How does it describe it? Uh, if you read Yusuf Ali's translation, this translation, I tell you it answers all your problems. You see, I think in Surah Ali Imran, say, Ya Yuhal Lazina Amanu, O you who believe, he says, Fear God as you ought to fear Him. <coughs> Ya you Lazina, who you believe? Fear Allah as you ought to fear Him. How do you fear Allah? Abdullah Yusuf Ali does it beautifully. He gives us in his commentary three different types of fears or four different types of fears. What is fear? He starts to explain. There is a fear, he says, number one, of a coward. A cowardly fellow. He's afraid of darkness. He's afraid of heights, he's afraid of this, afraid of that, afraid of everything. He said the abject fear of the coward, which anyone should be ashamed of. Everyone should be ashamed of. There is another type of fear, the fear of a reasonable man who wishes to avoid harm to himself or to someone he loves. My brother is driving too fast. So, now the fear of protecting his friends, his family, you know, forces him to slow down. He wants to drive 100 miles an hour. A reasonable man, or you see the signs there prohibiting him, uh, you know, your, your speed limits. They'll catch you, they'll find you. The barrier line, you cross it, he says, you'll be fine. So he's a reasonable man, he's trying to avoid harm to himself or to his family and friends. You know, it's a, a lot, it's a laudable quality, that fear. And there is another type of fear which is akin to love. 
that you love this object of love so much that you fear to do anything against the will of the beloved. Like in a crude way, I can tell you about my wife. You see, I love her. No, she's been my life partner for more than 40 years, and if, had it not been for her, I wouldn't be here. You know, she encouraged me and encouraged me that I left her at home and I'm here for a month, going round and round, all that. But I, I have a certain love for her, and there are things that I will not say to her for fear that it will hurt her. You know, she's so sensitive. My wife, I'm revealing the secret to you. <laughs> so sensitive that if I want to kill her, I don't have to touch her. I don't have to touch her at all. I don't have to give her cyanide. I tell you with words I can kill her. I know her. And I just have to say something every day. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll be dead, I tell you. She'll die. I know that being 40 years being with her, I can kill her like that. And no law in the world can get me. No. <laughs> but I fear to do that. I want to have a second wife, and a third wife, and a fourth wife. I'm human. I'm an animal by nature. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm polygamous in my mentality. But sh I can't do that. Why? I fear my wife. What? She's going to hurt me? No. She's so frail. If I blow, she'll blow away. <laughs> she's here, big and strong. But no. That fear, so I fear her, is a love. My love for her, I describe it in another word, I say I fear to hurt her. But that fear is not fear of she, she hurting me or killing me or doing anything to me, nothing. Is that love. And that is the fear of God. See, which Suleiman salam says is the beginning of wisdom. The love of God. That you, because you love God so much that you will not do anything to go against his will. <coughs> like that fear. So there are grades and grades of fear. The first one, everybody should be ashamed of. The second one, a reasonable man, he must take you know, makes you to behave correctly. Fear of what? Getting hurt. Getting your family hurt. That fear is reasonable. And this fear is the bedrock of, of, of the love of God. Thank you. Uh, uh, but Sheikh Zahram proved himself very right when he said he was his only humble man, uh, pretending that he doesn't know. You, you can hear his answer. You can, you, you can listen to his answer now. Yes? You talked about the relationship between God and man being one of the master and servant. Also, in my understanding, the most critical aspect between relationship between God and man or Allah and man is one of love. There is such a position where Allah is free to love man and man is free to love God. If man is a slave of Allah, he has no freedom to exercise his responsibility to love Allah. He is just the automaton. I'm sure everyone here in their hearts need to be loved by God. I need to be loved by God. If I'm a slave by God and cannot allow to do anything, then I cannot exercise my freedom to love God. God, in my understanding, the beauty of the father-son relationship is that there is the son has that freedom to love his father God. And in that position, Allah returns, or God returns as a father. And he cares, he loves, he teaches, he nurtures, he disciplines, he guides, he gives, he proves the lots in that relationship. And all that time there's that security in a father-son relationship that the man is tied to his creator God as a son. So my question to you is, if God is all-powerful, is your belief, why in his power cannot he cannot create a father-son relationship? Because to me, the most important event in the whole of history is, is the fact that man has been reconciled to God. We won't go into how that came about, I'm sure that we discussed on Saturday. But to me, if you're going to dismiss this father-son relationship, then you are dismissing the most important thing to man to know God. As I said, you see, these are just words, words, words we're using. Whether we use this term or that term, Jesus Christ is spoken of in the scriptures as the servant of God. That servant is an insult to him. He's a servant. So he said, look, we are his servants. If Jesus is a servant, we are his servant. Servant and master relationship. Why can't you love your master? You know, only as a son. What about the prodigal son? 
the father and son relationship? A slave can love his wife, right. but he does not have the freedom to express that love. Why hasn't he got the freedom? This God Almighty, look, he's given you the freedom. Adam, the first man, was he given the freedom to freedom of choice? Yes, he was. Right. So he was his servant and slave, his own, owned by the master, and yet he gave him his freedom. He said, look, I'm telling you now, go and enjoy yourself in the garden, eat anything except the fruit in the midst of the garden. You shall not eat, because the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And yet the man went and ate. Did he have the freedom of choice? He had. So you have the choice of loving God or denying him. The prodigal son Jesus told you about. He's staying with the father, that means with God. Both the sons, the good and the bad. One chooses to leave the father and go out on his own. Who's the father? God. And the son is given the freedom to move. Then he moves. And he makes the choice of coming back. This is the relationship. The relationship is you have the freedom of choice whether you use the term slave, servant, or son, but because of the sonship business, you are creating another idea, which in the minds of millions of the Hottentots and the Bushmen and the Bantus and the Indians in India, you know, whom you have Christianized in Indonesia, the type of understanding they have is a literal understanding of father and son, that God begot a son. Jesus is the only begotten son. And begotten, I don't know whether you say, is not modern language. You say it's not modern, I said, take it out of the Oxford Dictionary or the Webster Dictionary. It's there, begotten, it's an animal act. They said, look, since it's creating mischief, Islam have caused the use of words which have this type of meaning, you know, where you can play with words. Uh, thank you, Brother uh, Didat. Before we conclude our meeting, let me remind you again for the meeting on Sunday, I think this will provide you with ample chance to ask and bombard Mr. Uh, our brother did that with many questions as, and, and, and Dr. Clark uh, uh, as, as many as you can. And it is a tradition of our meeting to conclude by reading Surah Al-Asr together. The meaning of Surah Al-Asr for our friends who are not Muslim and who do not understand the meaning, it says, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is where by the phenomena of time that man is on the course of loss except that group who have faith in God and follow their faith or confirm their faith by, by good deeds and exhort each other to adhere to patience and to the truth. So let us read Surah Al-Asr all together as a conclusion of our meeting. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wal-Asr Inna al-Insana lafi khus إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العظيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد نبي الأمي على آله وصحبه وسلم